As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. One of the worst performances of my career, and they never doubted it for a second. We all go a little mad sometimes. I believe there's a hero in all of us that keeps us honest, gives us strength, makes us noble. You just gotta keep living, man. L-I-V-I-N. Son of a bitch. He stole my life. I love the smell of my pump in the morning. Welcome back to the Shop by Shop podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about one of my all-time favorite directors, a director who is in like my top four of, like I can't pick between them, favorite directors, and that is the one and only Sergio Leone. If you're not familiar with Leone, you're probably familiar with Quentin Tarantino, who frequently credits Leone as his all-time favorite director. He was an Italian director who really kind of changed the game in the Western where you know, if you say to most people, what's the most American genre of film, most of them will say the Western. Yet, most people would also say the good, the bad, and the ugly, or Once Upon a Time in the West, are the greatest Westerns of all time, with both of them uh, being Italian produced. So we're going to get into the Dollars trilogy, which I personally consider the best trilogy in film history, uh, with Fistful of Dollars, For a Few Dollars More, and The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, along with just some breakdown of Sergio Leone, along with the greatest film composer of all time, Neo Marconi. Uh, I think it's easily the best collaboration between a director and a composer in any film ever. But as you can see, we have a great guest with us today. Please welcome Anthony Devaney from the Raiders of the Lost podcast, which is my personal favorite film podcast, the podcast that really helped me want to get into podcasting myself. So Anthony, why don't you, you uh, introduce yourself? What's up, fellas? Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here to talk about also one of my favorite directors of all time. And the Western genre had a huge influence on me when I was 17 and I was doing Netflix by the mail and I discovered Leone's films. And uh, the first one I watched was Good, the Bad and the Ugly. And then I became really addicted to Western. So I watched everything from High Noon to Stagecoach to like 310 to Yuma, the contemporary one. So the Western genre really helped me fortify my love of cinema as well as foreign film. But Sergio Leone had a huge influence on me. So I'm super excited to talk about him and break down. I agree. It's one of the best trilogies of all time. And I think that especially for a few dollars more flies under the radars. It's a really true masterpiece and flat out one of the best Westerns of all time, but doesn't get lives in the shadow of good and the bad and the ugly, but uh, it's going to be a great conversation because it's just great art. I could not agree more. Uh, yeah, for, for, for a few dollars more is easily one of the most underrated films. And I totally agree. It gets overshadowed by some of his later stuff. But Oscar, why don't you give us your thoughts on Sergio Leone as a director and filmmaker? Yeah, for me, he is. I think I always have him in like my top four, um, pushing top three for me. Um, it's, it's so rare that you get a director. It's kind of a once in a lifetime thing. A uh, director's only made seven films and can be so influential as he is. And only, only really five of those films are really known to people. His kind of his other two films just uh, most people haven't watched or don't really recognize. And um, he and uh, Ennio Morricone just single handedly reinvented the Western genre, you know. You get a lot of people saying now through the reason they don't like westerns is because they're all really derivative of each other and they're all way too similar but then you start kind of going in more and you're kind of realizing that there's there's so many different westerns and i think they're just so wonderful to watch and each director has kind of their own different approach to the western um but yeah this trilogy obviously produced po quite possibly the most iconic music in history you know and the average person can just hear the music and you instantly think of Western. It's, it's, we're talking at that kind of level of influence. And yeah, with it, we kind of spawned in Leone's kind of classic direction, you know, your extreme close ups and the really nice transitions uh, that a lot of his films kind of have and so nice to watch. Um, but yeah, for me, absolutely one of my all time favorite directors. But yeah. For sure. Probably one of the maybe top three Italian directors of all time. I think just the Dollars trilogy alone, would you put put you up there? Like, is your impact of cinema is really super high, and it's even crazier that he topped it with probably his, his best work for me with Once Upon a Time in the West. I've not seen Once Upon a Time in America, but I heard that might even top it as well, which is crazy. Definitely one of the best to ever do it. I mean, he almost he took a genre that wasn't really respected at the very top of like cinema as like prestigious cinema, 
Um, he took the cliches of American Westerns, elements that really weren't looked at as prestigious, and he turned them into this. Well, the spaghetti Western genre existed, but he turned it into a subgenre that was really more respected and looked upon as some of the greatest films of all time now. It's cheaper and it's almost a bit goofier than like a John Ford Western that you would see in American cinema. Uh, it's very over the top, almost parodying like American Westerns. It's not afraid to get silly, whether that be like for the standout characters or the set pieces that Leone likes to do. Like these films are just, they're just so fun. I don't know how you could not enjoy a good Western by Leone. He's, he's, he said that his films are basically silent films um, and the dialogue's just there to add some weight. Uh, and like you've been saying, he makes great use of Morricone's score, the Italian way of filming, where the sound is done in post, adds such like different aspects to those kind of like over the top moments because they can just do anything with their sound effects to make it more impactful. Just editing around Morricone's score makes some of the best moments in all of cinema. So I think Leone's not only one of the best Italian directors to do it, he's just one of the best to ever do it in general. Well, what's interesting about what he did was in, in Italian cinema in the 40s and 50s with the neorealism in the post-World War II, uh, Fellini, Rosalini, um, and so many others, they, in movies like The Conformist, things like that, that's what Italian cinema was doing. But Sergio Leone tapped into a different genre from a different country with his Westerns, and that's the samurai genre with mostly Akira Kurosawa and um, Kobayashi and what they were doing. And the May of No Name trilogy is essentially a trilogy of samurai movies. But in America, in such a young country, the Wild West was the early days of the country. We didn't have swords. We had guns. We had muskets and rifles and pistols. And so he made the American samurai version of the Kurosawa films. And the structures are the same. The characters are very similar. I mean, everything from The Magnificent Seven is another Western that pulled off a Kurosawa adaptation with the Samurai Seven Samurai. But especially with the first film in this trilogy uh, is basically a, an adaptation of Yojimbo, the Kurosawa film, to the point where Kurosawa actually legally retained 15% of all box office revenue mm -hmm. because it was like an un, un... He didn't have permission from Kurosawa to adapt it, but he basically made this a Western version but that was so different from the Western genre what, from what we were seeing with John Ford and directors like that, where the characters were very strong and there was so much dialogue. They were very character centric. And there was also always a heavy use of the Native Americans versus uh, Americans, which were common themes throughout, especially with films like The Searchers. But with this film franchise, we have a lead character that barely speaks. You don't really know much about him. He's morally gray. Ultimately, we all view him as someone who is more in the moral high ground than the other characters in the films, but still he will do some nasty things if he wants to, and if he feels justified. But uh, I think the, the lack of dialogue really lends to the filmmaking and being able to explore, whereas John Ford's using large format and huge expansive framing, what Sergio Leone did, even differing from Kurosawa, was extremely wide. And not just a wide frame, but having your actors go across the entire frame, which is kind of really new for framing back then uh, with this extremely wide frame aspect ratio anamorphic but then not just shooting one character or a couple but filling the entire frame in different layers so editing that with the intense close-ups he really did create something he built off of kurosawa what he was doing with the samurai films then he did something his own um, um, that it came out as well was quite important um because by the 60s i mean he was making these for people in europe and i think around that time they were getting really tired of these really like wise talking American stars of the fifties that John Ford had really made popular. Um, like the John Wayne's you're talking about. Um, they kind of explored everything that they could have done with those characters. And then comes along Eastwood who really doesn't say much and he just looks very stern. Um, and like when he said like, I mean, this was like a snide mark at him, but he said that he has two impressions and it's one with his hat off and one with his hat on. <laughs> um, but yeah, just, the fact that it was a different kind of protagonist that just was really cool um, and brought up this and um, one of the most iconic characters and actors in cinema. Yeah, um, Anthony, what you mentioned about Eugene, I think it's funny that uh, Kurosawa, because he, he got the rights to the film in Japan as well from the copyright. And uh, when he, he released it there, he retitled it The Return of Yojimbo. And he said that he actually made more money from that film than he did from Yojimbo. And it's, it's, it's so funny. Um, 
But I think it's interesting that uh, both Henry Fonda and Charles Bronson were considered for the role initially as well, and obviously both end up in Once Upon a Time in the West. Um, three kind of very different actors. I think Charles Bronson more reflects what Eastwood is trying to accomplish with kind of the little dialogue um, in Once Upon a Time in the West, but Henry Fonda definitely isn't that. But yeah, I think it's interesting that they didn't, uh, Eastwood and Leody didn't really get off to a great start. Um, they took a while to warm to each other. Um, but yeah, by the end, it, um, <laughs> it all clearly worked out fine. Yeah, I think uh, I the no dialogue approach, or not no dialogue, but like how close it is to a silent film. I think that Leone really reminds us that the film at its core is music and picture in terms of just the foundation of the craft. And I think the way that he really shows us that a film can be, uh, like even though the silent film kind of died as an art form, there still is so much that can be done in moving an audience and entertaining an audience uh, with just music and picture simply. And he definitely is the greatest example of my philosophy that the top three most important things in film are one music, two music, three music, because the music in these films is just absolutely some of the best you'll ever see. And I think one of the first things that really kind of drew me to his films is the synchronization between the music and picture. Leone says that film is 40% sound. And I think I don't totally agree with that. I actually think it's even more. I would put it at like 50%. But even though we talk about uh, Marconi and his collaboration with him so much, I think his use of sound effects and immersive sound design is something that we don't talk about enough because uh, even though it's Once Upon a Time in the West after, like just that opening of the kind of the creaks of the sound effects and just the waiting for uh, the train to arrive. But then they kind of take that a step further in their collaboration between him and Neo where... Uh, Marconi is a composer, was one of the first to really use sound effects in his music and not just have the traditional orchestral Western score that we would hear in something like a John Ford film, something like a, like a Max Steiner type of score where Marconi was using things like, you know, gunshots and whip cracks and stampedes and like all different sound effects to really blur the lines between sound and music, which then you see, you know, composers like Hans Zimmer today who are doing a kind of really building on that idea of merging both music and sound together. And I think Marconi, uh, his background in, he was always experimenting with like the avant-garde of uh, music and sound design, even in his work before he even worked in film with doing things like incorporating a typewriter or the sound of a tin can into some of his arrangements and compositions. And I think just when the two of them, uh, finally found that collaboration where the spaghetti western was you know poverty b movies in italy these were some of the lowest budgets that you could ever imagine and to think that not only that one would travel to america because these were made for southern italy they even replaced a lot of the names to seem more american leone was credited as bob robertson which was actually because his father's stage name was a uh, roberto roberti so he used bob robertson son of robert for his stage name just to make them seem more American. And this was the B movie of the fistful of dollars was the B movie of its lineup behind. I think it was Souls don't argue is the name of the film. And it ended up becoming the first ever Italian Western to travel to America. And it took a few years because of those uh, court cases with Kurosawa. But I think once you kind of combined Leone with his desire to really reinvent the style of the Western, and, you know, not just tell a new story, but, you know, like we've talked about how the Western could be a bit derivative, but the way you tell the story and just bringing such a fresh style and approach to telling the story with someone like Marconi, who is such an inventive composer. And even when he's asked to do something simple, we'll do it in a way that's not generic and sounds like it's uniquely him from the first note. I know Hans Zimmer said that, too. Like when you hear a Marconi score from the very first note, you know, it's him. And I just think combining just such a the desire for innovation from both of them working in a movie that most people would just write off as, OK, I'm just here to get paid. We're here to complete the movie and not really looking to innovate or break the wheel. I think the way the two of them just really innovated and reinvented the genre is what makes Fistful of Dollars, even though it's the weakest of the trilogy, such a significant film uh, in all of film history. Yeah, with Morricone, he... Um his connection to the, to the story and the editing, he was, he's so, he was so miraculous with his ability to 
add to the edits. And I believe the showdown at the end of Good, Bad, the Ugly is the greatest combination of music and editing ever put on film. But what's funny is everybody knows his music, but most people associated with Quentin Tarantino's films. Because Tarantino with Kill Bill and Glorious Bastards and Django used, we all know, Ennio Morricone tracks. So when people hear that music, I think the average audiences generally think of Quentin Tarantino. So Tarantino beautifully used so much of the music that Morricone made in his films to contemporize it. And no other filmmaker I can think of has been able to, has ever really tapped into a, a composer who was so well known for a different filmmakers movies and i'm not sure if it can ever be done again because just like sergio leone because tarantino emulated his filmmaking so much the music just works and what's interesting about tarantino's use of it is it works in any period whether you have a contemporary sci-fi uh samurai film or you have a world war ii film the music still works so that shows the power of morricone's uh, music and also like the, the stuff he did for the thing, he threw that in the Hateful Eight. And then in the Hateful Eight, you got to see him make the action music for a Tarantino film. And that one of his sole Oscar, which is still crazy to think of. He only has one Oscar as a composer, but his music is so special. And he really is in the pantheon of all time film composers. Yeah, I I completely agree. I think, um, Alex, and to what you've been saying about like the combination, especially what you said about Alex, like the timing of the music and everything is so good. I'm gonna, uh, specifically, in for a few more dollars, like that end sequence in that film, um, when uh, I think Clint, Clint Eastwood says, and now we start, and the music just picks up as soon as he says that. And um, it's the exact same in Once Upon a Time in the West, when the, in the end, when uh, Charles Bronson steps into the frame, music kicks in exactly that moment. Um, and it's just uh, that kind of like connection between the two and with the um uh, the chime scoring uh for a few dollars more as well that kind of link between kind of what's actually happening in the picture and the music is going on i think that's such a kind of a, a unique part um, uh, of that score and what makes it so good that film um every every film in this trilogy and in morricone and um leone's career every every film they're evolving their filmmaking and evolving uh the composing of the music and it only just got better and better and better with every film and it, it shows throughout uh, for me uh every kind of leone western is is better than the next one um yeah like you said alex for me fistful of dollars is the weakest um I still think it's an absolutely great film for me on rewatch recently. It got, it got a lot better than my first watch. Um, I think uh, by that time I'd kind of come to respect and kind of understand Leone's style of filmmaking a bit more. And this, this one kind of stuck with me, but still definitely the weakest. Um, but there's kind of just no doubt that even if it's the weakest of the trilogy is, is an, an, unbeatable level of filmmaking and even if it's a remake it's it's a perfectly incredible remake much better than what we get nowadays and i think it's funny hearing recently that we were getting a fistful of dollars remake when you're not even remaking fistful of dollars you're just remaking your jimbo again um it's 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 stupid why they're doing that but um yeah i i still think it's a uh, really fantastic film yeah kind of like the same i mean i don't i don't think i hold fistful quite as high as yours um I think as well it's easily easily the worst of the trilogy and for for me a lot of the charm kind of comes from the fact that it's low budget like you've got leone basically unknown at the time working with nothing and the budget was two hundred thousand dollars and it was I, I, and I don't even know how it was funded it was funded by like german spanish italian funders who were constantly on set arguing about what they were going to pay for and charging off certain arguments it seemed like a bit of a mess just everything around the production of that in terms of the money side of it created that clint eastwood character like we're talking about and he was he was kind of an up-and-coming i think western star who wasn't allowed to make american movies as part of his contract from working on um, rawhide so he was able to come over to europe and I, I don't know how serious he took it i don't know if he really expected to or he definitely didn't expect it to blow up the way it has and became this like monumental moment in western cinema but it was, I think it was more of just a chance to get a holiday to Italy, if anything, even if the movie didn't succeed. So yeah, it's it's a low budget, 
they're working with basically nothing. I mean, even the camera crane, they had to borrow from other Italian productions because they weren't allowed to shoot during a Catholic holiday, whereas they just shot anyway. But the the kind of budget, I think his style still shines through. He kind of shows the classic close-ups, like we were saying. Um, they aren't as distinct and as strong as like a Once Upon a Time in the West, where it's like literally like just your eyes and it's like filling the frame. Um, it's not quite that, but you can definitely see style. Um, yeah, that's it. It, I, I don't, I don't love the film really. I think it's just kind of an average Western, honestly. If that, I, I don't, if that that may be a hot take. Um, but yeah, the, the score is kind of the standout here for me. Really, it's Morricone's movie. Um, because the plot, like we're saying, it, it is just your jumbo, and I'd rather just be watching your jumbo, to be honest. You, you can actually look at uh, Rick Dalton's character most of the time in Hollywood as an example, like a, a parallel to what Clint Eastwood went through when he went to Italy to make movies, not really sure of how it would go, and then he ended up making a mm -hmm. bunch, but also being uh, frustrated with the filmmaking style in Italy of not recording audio and going so on the cuff and mm -hmm. on the fly. So you can actually perfectly he and then coming back to America, a big star, uh, and then doing dirt, the Dirty Harry franchise and just becoming the big star in the world. Uh, so you can look at Rick Dalton as an absolute representation of Clint Eastwood's experience. Mm. Yeah, I never thought of it like that. That's that's a funny way to look at it. Yeah, <laughs> and I I'd seen that he like hated he kind of hated the Italian sets as well because they would just like they would sit and talk in the background because nothing that was recorded at the time mattered. So and I know that kind of annoyed them. Um, and they, and people would people speak their own native, native languages too. So people were di speaking different yeah, languages, yeah. which is so mm -hmm. confusing, I'm sure. Yeah, Sergio yeah. spoke no English either. He would just tell the actors, <laughs> to say, watch me. And he would like kind of like mime it himself because he, he spoke no English. Clint spoke no Italian. So I can only imagine how they pulled that off, but they somehow did it. Yes. It's incredible, but that just kind of goes to show what kind of cinema is a, a, as a language, really, in acting, um, that you don't kind of need that language barrier um, between kind of directors. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure Bong Joon-ho doesn't speak in, in much English. And you see kind of his films, I'm sure, with Mickey 17, who's entirely kind of American and English cast. Um, and obviously with Snowpiercer and things like that. Um, but, yeah, it's just it's incredible what what, uh, what they can do. And with the action in A Fistful of Dollars, obviously being the first one, uh, his cinematography obviously evolved so much more thanks to having a bigger budget, being able to get better lenses and a better crew, but it's still there. And he had this new perspective of shooting the shootouts where you're, he's putting the camera right behind the gun, uh, whether it be someone's pistol revolver or whether it be like the machine gun and putting it right behind the barrel nose or right behind Clint Eastwood's hand holding the revolver and then shooting it from the perspective of all the guys he's up against falling in unison and perfectly timing the staging in, in the, the squibs as well. But that was, he, he brought a new style to action directing that really hadn't been done before. And then he started, like you said, in a fistful of dollars, he started doing some of the close-ups, combining them with the wide shots to build tension, but really, honing that craft, especially when you're at the final showdown in the third film, which is just, they he perfected the three characters in one frame. He went even wider that time, but in Fistful of Dollars, you get, to, you get to see the early shot of that. And this is like watching an early Wes Anderson film where you can see the style. He just wasn't quite there yet. And he was honing it. He was figuring out what he liked to do in terms of how to frame and how to block. And then with their third or fourth films, they are, this is their style. Wes Anderson went through the same kind of transition of the first couple of films, Bottle Rocket, and then Royal Tenenbaums. And he's he's getting there, and then you have the apex with Grand Budapest and Moonrise Kingdom of this is what he does now. And so Sergio Leone did the same thing. And you can, like you said, with the evolution of the music getting better, and a fistful of dollars, and then for a few dollars more, they're beautiful scores, and they're amazing. But Good, the Bad, and the Ugly is it's absolute just magic. The themes, the music, the electric guitar, the riffs, uh, the wood, the, the wind instruments, the brass, the choir work. It's just unbelievable. And with the first two films, it's like Ennio was like, he oh, he was getting there. He, and then he he was making great scores and finding the, the, the tones, the melodies. And it seemed like the good, the bad, the ugly was 
for the main themes and the main pieces of music he wrote, it was like the, the culmination of the work in the previous films. And he finally cracked like the perfect score for a film, like an all time huge composition piece of music that is still unparalleled to this day in many respects. Like it really is that good. Like it's up there with like what Howard Shore did with Lord of the Rings. Uh, it's that integral to the story and that beautiful. And it's just like Leone's evolution of the camera work. The music evolved too for each film and just somehow I agree with the, I agree that each film got better. Um, but I still love them all, but it's just amazing how they both fed off each other to ultimately end on the masterwork of good and the bad. I think it's, it's so funny. We're kind of talking about kind of these three, kind of the dollar just just dollars trilogy but i know for me ryan and alex once upon a time in the west is like the magnum opus this is like the culmination of culminations more of a culmination than what the good and the bad and the ugly is um i think it's just perfect everything um that film and i think uh, for me i morricone's work obviously in the dollar tree is absolutely incredible but i think the versatility in once upon a time in the west just outshines uh these three films and kind of the differences that he um uh, the different time, uh, sorry, different types of scores that he has in that film, and uh, yeah, just the magnum opuses of all magnum opuses really once upon a time in the West, and it's it's kind of such a testament to kind of. I'm not trying to obviously downplay this trilogy, but uh, it's just it's it's I just love it when you can see a director just evolve over time and a composer as well. But yeah, this is just perfect example for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what's yeah, was, what's cool about a fistful of dollars is. I mean, for a few dollars more, it's also one of the best bank robbery movies ever. I mean, can we talk about that bank robbery and how good it is? And I, I watched it again this spring, and I was like, that's honestly one of the best bank heists I've still ever seen put on film. And contemporary movies, the 99% of them can't even touch that. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, I, I totally agree just on the idea of just how they – the films kept getting better with each film. And I'll even take it one step further. I think Once Upon a Time in America, which is like my third favorite film of all time and my favorite English language film. And I just think that one, he even took a step further from Once Upon a Time in the West. I think both Leone and Marconi consider that their best work together and where you really see like this evolution of, you know, 20 plus years working together and just, they were just so in sync by then and on every level between the music and the picture. But I like how uh, the music in his films really is the dialogue. And I view the score uh, for most films as really the emotional script of the film. Like the written script is story, that's character. But the music is really like the emotional script and really kind of guides how you feel about everything. And I love how in all of these films, the music kind of essentially becomes the dialogue. And... Uh, I totally agree with everything Anthony said about, you know, when you see these great directors, whether it's Tarantino, Wes Anderson, Scorsese, any of them, you look at their early work, their early work might not be the most polished or the most entertaining film for like a general audience viewer, but you typically see traces of their style and, you know, them trying things that they eventually want to build uh, and keep doing later in their career. And I think you certainly see that with Leone a lot where, you see him do things like this uh, contrast of extremes that I've always loved where, you know, typically in the American Western, there would be like a medium shot to kind of as a transition shot between an extreme wide and an extreme close shot. And Leone will just cut straight between the extreme wide and the extreme close. And I just love his kind of uh, swing of extremes between them. And the Western typically, like most people, especially when you get into people like John Ford, it's all about, you know, the landscape, the spectacle, but, Leone really knows how to capture the landscape of a human face. And he says that he uses these real tight shots because they really draw your attention to the eyes. And I think that him and a lot of my other favorite filmmakers really know how to do so much storytelling just with a stare or with the eyes. I think his direction of faces is some of the, some of the best you'll see in film history. And, you know, just in like my own work and the stuff I've directed, I've noticed that, the, some of the best performances I've been able to direct myself have been the ones where like there wasn't dialogue that needed to be recorded. And I was able to just play music on set and kind of let that guide the actor's eyes and their emotions. And I think Leone's uh, I'm sure the 
you know, dub everything in post approach was a headache for the actors for a number of reasons, like Clint Eastwood described. But I think it pr it really did a lot of uh, justice to the performances and what he's able to bring out of the actors in terms of those, that facial acting and how much is just communicated with those face shots where he was able to play Marconi's music on set, not with Fistful of Dollars, but more in the later films, especially once you get to Once Upon a Time in America and Once Upon a Time in the West, where the music would just literally take the actors on an emotional journey psychologically. And it just bleeds through in that really tight shot where every single minute movement on the actor's face is captured. And I think once you get to it for a few dollars more, you really see the, uh, the faces captured uh, with the first true, like Leone close-ups. I think he attempts it in the fistful of dollars, but if you notice the, he doesn't have the as tight of the close-ups on the actors yet. Like you'll see him once upon a time in the West where he cuts off the forehead and the chin. Where in once in for a fistful of dollars, it's more just the stairs. When we get into for a few dollars more, I think we start seeing that kind of minute facial movements as well. And as well as just the movements of the face, the the way so much storytelling is done just with the body movements of the actors, whether it's you know the hands of the actors. This definitely comes from Kurosawa, who is really good at this as well and a lot of other great directors as well but the way he captures like really distinct human behavior and the speed of those motions just when the actors move really slow and just slows down the entire energy it slows down or speeds up your heart rate based on the speed of the on-screen motion that he just has such kind of like a mastery of and yeah i think that's just always been one of the things that really has drawn me to leone's films there's another director that comes to mind um, with the photography of faces and he he along with uh, leone and his dp are really the best who's ever done and he's also someone who's been heavily duplicated but never no one's been able to really match it it's jonathan demi and he shoots faces in a very different way where leone will always shoot it um at an angle and extreme tight demi will have would have his actors look dead center into frame with tight close up um, and literally looking at the audience. So the, it's a completely different effect, but I always get the same kind of feeling when I see the Demi close ups in his films like Philadelphia and Sounds of the Lambs. Um, and uh, th this, the two filmmakers, they, they created a new way of photographing the face. And nobody's on either, on either approach, nobody's been able to really capture what they did because like they were the masters at it. Um, and I think that the evolution of the tighter close-ups has to do with maybe his producers were didn't want him to. Maybe he was still trying to emulate Kurosawa a little too much, so he's keeping it a little bit wider. But maybe he didn't have the proper lenses to really photograph almost at a macro level or to have like the extremely long lens, wide frame, wide aspect ratio, and make sure the focus is there. Maybe they didn't have the, the camera tech for those. Maybe he wanted to get those shots, but he couldn't. In the first film and in the second film and then he was able to get those extreme tights like on people's eyes uh, for the final film mm. yeah there's also those aspects of like the i mean I, I don't think there is as much in festival but the really wide shots of the landscapes you were talking about alex um that john ford was talking are known for really capturing those landscapes of um the us which is honestly it's something that really improved as leone got that big budget further along and that's something that you see this progression across the trilogy even further into once upon a time in the west where it does look like it's it, well some of it is shot in the u.s in that one but it really does look authentic whereas in these early ones especially you can tell it's spain um it doesn't look perfectly towards the kind of western side even in the good the bad and the ugly and some of the some of the moments or scenes in that movie are very obvious towards that where i was like that just looks like a shot taken straight out of lawrence of arabia and then I went and looked up and it was the exact same locations in Spain, some of the places that they did shoot. So yeah, there, there are some moments in these where it's really obvious, obvious that it's not in the US. Um, but that does add to the charm of his kind of style of the spaghetti western, I think. Yeah, if for me, it doesn't really bother me that much that this kind of it doesn't feel like this American West. I, I, I when I first found out, it shot me that this this was filmed in Spain. I, I don't really associate that kind of environment with Spain, I guess. But it was it's kind of a really nice ad that he managed to make this environment feel like like the definitive Western environment uh, for me, anyway. Um, but yeah, I think 
I think the the kind of Dollar Trilogy as a whole, especially Fist Flies, mm-hmm. is charm of like that kind of signature gun echo sounds so nice. And obviously you have the, the really bright red blood, which I, I kind of miss in cinema a lot. Obviously it's unrealistic, but it is is something that's just so classic and something I, I miss in uh, in films. And it's, it's very nice to see rewatching these films. And also, I mean, the, the characters evolve so much better with each film. And he interestingly used an actor he worked in one film and made them the villain in the next film Mm -hmm. in terms of Indio being who I think is really an all time movie villain in the second film who goes really unnoticed in the film community uh, discussions. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever talks about him. He's a phenomenal villain being uh, a smaller villain in the first film. And then Lee Van Cleef obviously being (laughs) Clint's ally in the second film and then being the ugly, I mean the bad in Good, Bad, the Ugly, it's amazing that he was able to use the same actors and give them completely different roles uh, and really let them express uh, their strengths really well. And they're all great characters, but what the constant is, is the male with no name. And we've gotten new versions of the male with no name. I think right now, the first couple John Wicks were a male with no name. However, they've gone too much into the world building in his background where they've kind of taken away the mystery of John Wick that was so strong in the first film. But he is like a new version of that character, a gunslinger, a lone wolf. Um, he just he's in the, those films. He's traveling, and um, he does have a moral great compass. But we still are behind him, and that's the strength of the man with no name. Really, is even by the third film, we don't know anything about him. And you could say they're all different characters, or you could say they are all the same character. But the audience puts themselves in his shoes. But I think because of the lack of personality and the lack of history and character depth. We're able to be the male with no name when we watch these films because it's le- so much less characterization. And then Sergio and his writers obviously focused heavily on the villains of each movie really well. That's where the characters come in. The characters of all the, the villains in these films are the personalities, most of the dialogue. Um, and with the male no name, you you know he's a good guy, but also he's not a hero, really. He'll do the right thing when he has to, and he does have a line and if someone crosses a line he will get them back for it and he will do the right thing but half the time he's in it for himself um and because that's also because he's always encircled by villainous people he doesn't really feel guilt when he kills many of these people but uh there the moral gray ambiguity of the man of no name is why he probably is the definitive anti-hero um, that has been tried to do be copied many times before there's really only one uh, Clint Eastwood. Uh, he brought so much to that, but it really is the approach to the character of let's not tell the audience anything about this guy. And I miss that. I miss having great characters that you don't know anything about. They just are there in the world. And now everybody needs a sob story. Everybody needs a monologue. Uh, and to the point where it just gets derivative and there's no mystery. And one of the strengths to this entire trilogy is the mystery of the male of no name. And he did, he did a great job with Bronson and Once Upon a Time in the West. But Bronson obviously has a a backstory that's motivating him. So you get more character depth with him. We still get the same approach to the lack of dialogue and the just the stoic nature. But I love the male no name because we don't know anything at all about his past. Yeah. Do do you guys actually know that he the man with so the whole man with no name was completely invented. So the film was made in 1964 in Italy. But because of the lawsuit with Kurosawa, it didn't get released in America until 67. It had already been a huge hit in Europe, but uh, mm-hmm. it wasn't the for a few dollars more had already been completed and released in Europe by the time Fistful of Dollars hit the US. And The Man with No Name was completely because they were screened a lot as double features, and it was completely invented by the American marketing. And, and there's a few moments in for a fistful of dollars where they actually address him as Joe. He actually has it, he's named Joe in. For a fistful of dollars, but then they adapted it into a book and they specifically left out any reference to him being called Joe because the man with no name became such a iconic part of his character and really did add that sense of mystery. And I totally agree. I think the kind of ambiguous nature, kind of both morally and just backstory wise of his character, like the only sense of backstory we get really for the character ever is uh, when he frees the family and rescues them and says, I knew someone like you once and there was no one to help. And, you know, we don't know if that's, you know, his mother, if it's his, I mean, I think 
I would assume that it's his mother, but like it could be his, his sister, it could be uh, his wife. We have no idea. So yeah, I, I think that the because I think it's it goes back to the kind of Alfred Hitchcock theory of what you don't see can often be more powerful than what you do see. And I think because we don't really get a, like we don't get a full monologue, or we don't really get a full exposition backstory for him. It just gives the audience more things to talk about. And I think Kubrick was another director who was great at that. It's just kind of leaving things ambiguous, especially for the modern age where, you know, with YouTube and social media, everyone likes to theorize things. And, you know, it just provokes so much more discussion when you can talk about different theories of what the backstory of the character is rather than everything being told to us and us knowing exactly what it is. So I, I totally agree. And in terms of like the morality of the character, I think one of the really interesting things about the good, the bad and the ugly is that it very directly in terms of like telling us what it is directly labels all three of the characters. But if it wasn't for that good, badly and ugly label, we probably wouldn't view the character. We probably wouldn't describe the characters that way ourselves. And I think when Leone brings back in at the very end of the film, once again, shows us who's the good, who's the bad and who's the ugly. I think more than anything, we've now realized how thin those lines are between all of them. And we realize that it's not very clear what the differences are between the characters. You know, it's really just small things like Clint Eastwood giving that soldier a cigar. But it's like, is he really that much different from the other two characters? They're all pretty much motivated by greed. They're all, you know, cold blooded killers at the end of the day. So I think in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, because in when for a fistful of dollars came out in America on TV, they, without any conversation with Leone, did a prologue to the film where uh, Clint Eastwood was working for the U.S. government, and he was there like on a mission for the government to make it seem like it was like this morally correct movie. And I think by the good, the bad, and the ugly, he was really directly commenting on the the criticisms of the morality of the American Western, where. He was saying that because traditionally when you look at like the John Ford or the Fred Zinneman films, there's the good guy wore white, the bad guy wore black. And it was always like very clear cut, good and bad. And I think one of Leone's greatest contributions to the Western genre was really showing us how blurred those lines are. And it's really not so clear cut, good and bad. It's, it's normally a little bit of both. And if we're not told who's the good, who's the bad, then we probably wouldn't believe that in a, in a more realistic sense we probably wouldn't uh assume give them those labels ourselves so i think the good the bad and the ugly he's more directly kind of criticizing those labels rather than labeling the characters that way himself in a lot of ways tuco can be the most likable character in good and bad and i think really the only real difference is that man with no name he doesn't kill if he doesn't have to where I think Tuco would kill someone just he he's the kind of person who would kill. He doesn't often kill for fun, but he would kill. Um, and he, he's killed people when he has to, but I think he will cross that line. He's not he's not afraid to. Uh, and obviously Angel Eyes kills for fun in a lot of ways. Uh, but you're right, it, Tuco and the man with no name are very close in terms of morality. But I think that the man with no name just barely outskirts him closer to the side of good because his, his willingness to spare when he doesn't have to. Uh, he If he doesn't have to kill someone, he won't kill them. And I think ultimately that's the line for the audience that the audience needs to be able to root for this guy, where he only kills if he has to or if it's justified to. I think Tuco would cross that line he has in the past. Um, but he also they did a great job with Tuco characterizing his trouble past with his brother and his family. And I, one of my favorite scenes is sequences is when he's with his brother, who's the priest now at that old church, and really get to getting to learn more about the relationship. And you think this guy is just like a dirty, grimy, uh, blood sucking criminal who will do anything to make some money. But then you learn he comes from a tragic past and a broken family. And um, his brother chose the side of good, but is his brother even a good man? Ultimately, that's in question too. So he did a great job with the morality of Tuco's character. And I think Lee Van Cleef's Angel Eyes is truly the despicable villain, hence the bad title for him. But I think Tuco and Mayo No Name are pretty similar in their moralities. I think a lot of the characters are quite ambiguous, especially in um, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. Especially compared to Festival of Dollars, where I think 
Um, like Eastwood is more kind of that Ujimbo character where he's the middleman and he's kind of more of an objective look at both sides of the people in the town. So I don't think he's like quite on the side of bad until that quite that third one where they're like scamming people by sending Tuko into the town, saving him and stealing the money. Um, but yeah, I think even other than like the kind of like anti-heroes, I think just the strong point of Leone and a lot of his films is kind of introducing those characters. The introductions are always super strong and just instantly get you attached to them. Like, well, Once Upon a Time in the West has some of the best ever, I think. Um, and a few dollars more, I think Lee Van Cleef, you're introducing this guy that is, I mean, he's kind of the co-protagonist of this film, um, along with Eastwood. Um, so that introduction has to be super strong. And he introduces him with this, like him stopping the train, coming out, stealing the, the Dead or Alive poster for the, the guy that he's going after. And again, he's introducing that kind of thing that he doesn't want to point out time in the West, where you've got this, this character that's out for revenge, but you don't know really anything about what he's, he's doing or why he's there. And of course, he does explain it to the end, but it still leaves that kind of ambiguous kind of character throughout the film, and you don't really know why they're there or what they're doing. There's always that mystery um, leading that climax in the film. Um, and I love the kind of first moment we see with Lee Van Cleef where he goes to get that guy with the bounty and he chases him for the street. And I love how impressive he makes him look. There's the guy at the other end of the street, he's shooting him with his pistol. He looks really close up at first and it looks like he's missing. Um, and then it's revealed that he's miles away on the other side of the town. And every time he shoots and misses, it zooms in further, kind of closing up, tightening into his face. He shoots him with one go with his really stupid attachment on his pistol and he just looks like the coolest guy like maybe even equal to Eastwood I think he almost kind of steals the show um in the second movie um which is an accomplishment in itself being as cool as Eastwood but also I think it's important to kind of make them an equal level protagonist for the rest of the story and he um, lets him kill him at the end yeah I think the characters around Eastwood are equally as interesting in this film yeah, I think it um, on set, I think Lee Van Cleef actually, uh, they kind of tested out their draws and Lee Van Cleef actually had a quicker draw, the um, kind of draw cock and fire than what Eastwood had. I think he could do it in like an eighth of a second, three frames they they uh, they counted it in. Um, but yeah, like you were saying, um, Indio played by Jean Maria uh, Volante. He gets so overshadowed in this film. It's such a fantastic performance. Um, I watched him recently in <clears throat> Jean Pierre Melville's uh, The Circle Rouge, and he was really, really fantastic in that as well. Um, <clears throat> he kind of gives this really kind of twisted uh, performance compared to kind of what we see in uh, Fistful of Dollars. And I like that this film kind of takes that chime score for kind of his character and it really makes him stand out. Um, in comparison to the first film and obviously that's kind of used for kind of as like a timer um towards the end of the film and especially in that final genre i love how that's woven in um but yeah i just love the kind of using the same actors across the films and kind of this ambiguity like people saying oh is, is this the same character it's like no he like he died in the last film and um and um it doesn't really bother telling you that this is a different character even though uh for the most for the most characters in the film actually is um but yeah the ambiguous nature i just uh, i just take ambiguity over um forced exhibition any day of the week um <clears throat> uh, but yeah just that that chime score just plays in my head every single day it's, it's such a great piece of music and it works so well but indio is so great because he's not He's not the villain that had a troubled past that we're used to now, like they were abused or or whatever. He caused his own trauma, and he's riddled with the guilt of assaulting that woman years ago, who ends up being obviously uh, Lee Van Cleef's sister. I like that he caused his own self trauma, and that's what's fueling his addiction to drugs and um, his moral his morality is at, in question which I think makes him double down on his ruthlessness. And on top of the bank heist, we get the, the there's basically another heist in the opening when he's broken out of prison, which is just so well shot and so suspenseful. I love when his gang breaks him out. It's something that's been copied so many times now, but this is really probably the first film that did something like this in both film, in both of these things in one film, the prison break and the bank heist. 
both being exciting, unpredictable, so well photographed and staged, and the sequences are incredible action. Um, and I love them both. And and I do enjoy the story because it's so unpredictable where you think Clint and Lee have them figured out, but the bank heist goes in a completely different way. And they are just completely awestruck and left of what to do now. Um, so I think that Indio's brilliance as a villain is so incredible. And it, he really is up on par with um, the bad Angel Eyes in Good, Bad, and the Ugly. And in some ways, he is a superior villain. Gian Maria Volante, who plays him, is uh, also an actor who really doesn't get enough credit. If uh, anyone's familiar with Italian cinema, he's not really a well-known name from for American audiences today, but he is in a lot of the most iconic Italian films of all time. And just your European cinema as a whole, like doing films with Melville, as well as you know, Sacco and Vanzetti, which is a very iconic Italian film, and uh, Investigation of a Citizen Above Suspicion with Leo Petri. So he's a very accomplished actor, and he was he was the one of the group who really came from the theater and was, they said, kind of more over the top with his acting, and Leone felt like he constantly had to like bring him down and would make him do a lot of takes to make his performance more reserved than his more like kind of theatrical approach to it. But since we're kind of getting into for a few dollars more, I think it's time to drop my hot take. And that is that when it comes to this film or good, the bad, and the ugly, I think the better films, whichever I've watched more recently, but after just rewatching them right now, I am leaning for a few dollars more a little bit. And I think well, it's just, sorry, we say. That is a hot take. I think it's <laughs> I mean, getting closer sorry. for me. It's getting closer. Every time I watch them, they're just, it's getting closer and closer. It's amazing how good it is. It's so good. Mm. It really is so impressive. Ultimately, it's the like um, good and the bad, the ugly scope and scale and magnetism mm -hmm. and the breadth of the mm -hmm. filmmaking and narrative that really put it over the edge for me and the three-man showdown at the end. Mm -hmm. I, I think the the ending of Good and the Bad, that's one of the... I think it possibly is the greatest piece of cinema ever put on screen. And so when that happens, it's just like pure magic. So I, I can't put anything above that, but the second film is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I think a lot of it does come from Marconi's score. It is, a part of this might be that I've rewatched Good, the Bad, and the Ugly a lot more than I have for a few dollars more. So since I hadn't seen it as much, it felt a little fresher to me on this rewatch. But uh, I think so much of it, I, I totally agree. I think the trio in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly is probably the greatest musical track in the history of film scores. Like that scene, I agree, is better than anything in the whole trilogy that final standoff and good the bad and the ugly is as perfect of cinema as cinema can be i think what i really stands out to me with for a few dollars more is how different the score is from from the rest of them and i think that uh so marconi was like a classically trained composer and his uh his mentor was uh gofredo petrassi i, I might have got the first name wrong but uh, that was his mentor, and they all kind of looked down on Marconi's work in film scores at the time, and were because they they considered it. Uh, Petrassi referred to it as like prostitution for composers doing music for film. Like they believed in you know more traditional orchestral composition, and you know Petrassi did do film scores as well, but he did them for a paycheck. Where Marconi really believed in the art form of composing for film, and. Petrassi did, however, compliment his work on for a few dollars more. And I think it's just because it's it feels the most unique. You have like that kind of gothic organ sound. You have like that the chime of of the watch. And just even when the score is taking like a simpler approach and something that doesn't jump out at you, when you watch a lot of Hollywood films, like those scenes where the, the score is more like an underscore and not meant to be noticed, often sound very repetitive and the same for a lot of Hollywood ones. But even when Marconi's doing those subtler underscores, I think there's just such a unique quality of them. And I'm not uh, educated enough musically to necessarily pinpoint in words what that is that makes them so different. But I just think every sound and score use in that film is so unique. And that's one of the things that really jumped out at me on a rewatch of For a Few Dollars More. And I think it's just, it's such an upgrade from... Uh, from a fistful of dollars in every possible way where Marconi on a fistful of dollars came in very late in the game. Like they had already shot the film and had completed it and 
Leone had wanted to work with the composer who he did Colossus of Rhodes with, but the producers convinced him to go and uh, meet with Marconi. And when they met, Marconi recognized them that they had actually went to grade school together. And for the score for a fistful of dollars, it, um, it was actually one that Marconi had used for another film that the director didn't want. And it was a combination of that and Leone loving this one theme from uh, Howard Hawks' film, Rio Bravo. So to a degree, they were doing a bit of an imitation of that. And Leone actually wanted to license the Rio Bravo theme, but Marconi quit and threatened to quit over it. So Marconi never really felt like the fistful of dollar score was his. And he was, it was never something he was that proud of. Whereas for, for a few dollars more is the first time I think they really are collaborating together and actually, you know, having those discussions of the score before the film. And I think you really start to see Marconi getting really inventive with, uh, for for a few dollars more. And he says in his career he liked working with first-time directors because that's where he can get really inventive. If you look at any of his like, kind of first scores with directors, they're typically very different. I think he's one of the most versatile musicians in history. Absolutely. Just the range of his career is truly incredible. But I think he takes a lot of really big swings on for a few dollars more, which makes it just a very interesting film to study and explore, in my opinion along with, you know, just an upgrade on every level from the way they capture the close-ups, the small behavior of the actors, the way they, the lighting is just so much smoother without kind of just harsh sunlight for most of the, the shots. And, you know, the, the cinematography, the pacing, the editing, things like just the smallest of things like using point of view where when they see the bounty poster, uh, Lee Van Cleef, looks or uh what's his name clint eastwood looks at it and he looks up at the reward money where lee van cleef looks down and looks at the name because to him it's not about the money it's personal and there's like this duel of the eye close-ups and just really starting to tap into the character's psychology a lot more yeah, exactly. and for a few hours or more i think is such a strength and yeah it's i think such an underrated film yeah i think it's crazy that uh leone did not want to make a follow-up but was forced into it by the uh, production company refusing to pay him for a fistful of dollars. That's the only reason this film was made. Um, which is 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 a is just is wild to think about um, that something so bad um, forced us forced him into making something so good. Um, but yeah, I I completely agree with what you were saying. Um, for me, the most memorable shot of the trilogy, apart from the final kind of uh showdown in uh good the bad and the ugly is that shot in the final jewel this film was like lee van cleef and it's got the sunlight behind him and it's just this gorgeous like orange glow and it, it it looks so different from any kind of shot that comes after it before it and it just has this such a standout look to it and it is it's oh. is so so nice after watching a lot of Herzog films, it's so weird seeing rewatching this and seeing Klaus Kinski in this film. It's such <laughs> random because he's like he's he's such a crazy, crazy <laughs> man. He is absolutely nuts, and he, we kind of see it a bit in this. But I, I I think he's a terrific, terrific actor, an interesting man at that. Um, I just watched Aguirre. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's an incredible film. I absolutely love that film. And uh, Fitz Corraldo as well, um, I think, is also incredible. Um, he gives two kind of all-time performances in those films. But, yeah, it's just it's really weird seeing him in this and kind of going back and seeing that was was uh, really nice. But, yeah, he kind of gives a uh, kind of solid side performance in this. But, like you've been saying, a lot of people get overshadowed in this film because you've got Clint Eastwood at the helm. But, yeah, just great film. I think what separates Morricone from so many other composers of the time, and he was, I look at him as he was the Bernard Herrmann of Italy, uh, where Bernard Herrmann also used by Tarantino in some of his films, the famous whistle, that's Bernard Herrmann track, um, and a couple other tracks he used in his films, uh, where it was a time where the full orchestra was still being used for uh, the language of cinematic music and certain kinds of ways of making right in the music was still kind of rigid and Morricone he's just like using solo electric guitar riffs or just that beautiful acoustic guitar melodies um a lot of choir work um these are these are things that we weren't really see, audiences weren't really hearing when they watched films especially the western and so 
the language of his music changed, and he did do plenty of those full orchestra classical arrangements like in the mission um but that still is his voice and it still has the the, the tones but a composer is so much so defined not just by how they write but what kind of instruments they use and there's a reason why john williams scores always sound like john williams scores it's not just the writing but it's also what he chooses to write music for in terms of instruments like the french horn nobody has ever used the french horn like john williams does and what john williams likes to do is he'll write a melody and then he'll have different parts of the orchestra play the melody and then he'll put them all together um and so it's this like evolution and this building t uh, of all of the pieces of the orchestra until they unite with the the full piece together um in that arrangement he likes to do that a lot and his jazz background adds to the complexity of the the bounciness of his music uh whereas morricone he's so, so much more streamlined in his approach less is more slowly building the mood and it really i think in these films and then once upon a time it's really the use of the guitar and just one guitar that really set himself apart from any other composer um I'm, I'm sure in spain some composers were doing that but i'm pretty sure in terms of like electric guitar riffs i don't think anybody was doing it like this at the time in a film score my favorite is when he uses the harmonica in Once Upon a mm -hmm. Time in the West. And I think it stands out even more because it, it's diegetic. Like the characters can actually hear the score. And I feel like a lot of the time it's more of the scores kind of surrounding the film. Um, but again, like with the chime, the chime of the pot or the pocket watch in this, it's just brilliantly because like the characters can actually hear it. And there's that brilliant countdown of where they're they're standing across from each other to shoot. And it just keeps counting down. And there's so much tension building up to that. And it's probably one of the best moments in Leone's films is when Eastwood walks in with the other pocket watch that he, he took off um, Lee Van Cleef's character earlier in the film. And then there's obviously that reveal of him being the sister of the, the woman that he killed. I think that is one of the best moments and it works so well because the characters can actually hear that score and it stands out from the, the other scores that he's used in this trilogy. Yeah, I'm so happy that you brought up the uh, the electric guitar because it's one of those things where it's like, can you do that? Like, can you use an electric guitar? It's like so not a Western instrument. Like you would think grand orchestral or like folk sounding. And it's it's once again, it just goes back to his kind of outside the box experimenting mindset of, you know, using sound effects in scores. So it's like when you're doing that, it's like the electric guitar isn't even the most bold decision that he made. And I think that I just the inventiveness of him is a, like I love John Williams. I think John Williams is undebatably one of the greatest composers in history. But I think what separates Marconi from Williams is just that inventiveness with the instruments. And I totally agree with you that the instruments really do define the composers. And I just think the range of what Marconi uses is so unmatched by most others. And I think, you know, a lot of people look at this trilogy and some people might say, oh, it's not a real trilogy because there's not that it's not like, you know, Star Wars, let's say, or Lord of the Rings, where there's this narrative thread between the three films. They're kind of very much their own isolated thing. And you could argue it's not the same character, but I think the music really is a big part of unifying them, where when we finally get to the final duel, he incorporates pieces of the music for every films where uh fistful of dollars we have the, the the mariachi trumpets which are like the iconic part of that score and then for a few dollars more we have the uh the chime score of the watch and then for like ecstasy of gold and the good the bad and the ugly we have that kind of piano circular circular piano theme so once we get to that final duel he starts combining all three of those and really merges all the elements musically of the three films together in that final duel which is probably the greatest you know combination and synchronization of sound and music and picture ever put to film and i think that's a big part of just what makes this a cohesive trilogy is the way marconi really does evolve the music to that point sublime <laughs> <laughs> one well, other interesting dude. fact actually is that even though he's so known for his melodies especially when you get into a film like cinema paradiso he actually hated melody Marconi. He really loved to use dissonance instead, which was another thing he did that was frowned upon. But they said once you get, they got into the 70s, he was using it so much that like people didn't want to hire him anymore. And 
His mother, on the other hand, would always tell him, like, Neo, write something beautiful, write a nice melody. So that part of his style really comes from his mother. But his father, both Leone and Marconi were, were industry kids. Leone's father was a big silent film director who actually turned down directing for Polo Negri, one of the big silent film stars, when Leone was born. And uh, Marconi's father was a trumpet player who worked in silent films. So he has such a background in trumpet and I think his frequent use of that instrument, which I think is the way you talked about the French horn with John Williams. I think the trumpet is a big defining instrument of Marconi really comes from his father. So I think you kind of see the, the trumpet from his father and the melody influence from his mother to kind of define his style. Yeah, he always loved the wooden breasts, uh, like oboe use in the mission is his other like huge defining uh, piece of music. So, so he, he gravitated to the woodwind and the brass instrument so much. And, and it's funny because I remember w when Hans Zimmer used electric guitar for Inception and Johnny Marr, um, the, he hired Johnny Marr as the guitarist for it. And people were like, electric guitar in a movie score? Chris or Nolan? Every, I remember people didn't think it was going to work. And then it ended up being so good. He ended up using guitar so often now. It's funny that even to this point in the 21st century, the idea of electric guitar and a film score still is kind of like taboo. And people don't think it seems to suit a feature film. But he did it in the 60s. I think it's one of the best instruments to, to use in film scores, honestly. Like, it's even like, you know, the way... Uh, I went off if it's electric guitar, but the way Howard Shore uses it for the departed score, like it's so not a traditional film yeah. score, but is subtly, I think, one of the best in history. Great score. Yeah, I, I love electric guitars. So anytime that that's in a score, that's that, that's part of why I defend the amazing Spider-Man too, is I just love the, like when they use the electric guitar there, like I love the score in that movie, even though there's a lot of- That does not save the movie. It does. <laughs> 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 it, it, it can work though he did a great job with it in rush uh with the electric guitar it's fucking awesome mm. that's a great score um but i expect him to do something similar because hans is doing f1 when that comes out next year mm. but there's something that i also think separates good and the bad in terms of the scope of it you have characters traveling great distances the first two films are so much smaller in scope and they do work for it um the second film gets a little bit bigger where your characters and the gangs are in different areas and the first one really centers on that one small town but the the breadth of literally traveling the country in good and the bad and we're getting huge set pieces from uh, the western towns to uh, the prison camp to the huge civil bat civil war battle uh in the cemetery um it really is a, a culmination of finally getting a good budget and wanting to do huge set pieces and pull them off in amazing ways. Um, so that, that's something that I love about Good and the Bad that the other two are, are lacking in, obviously, because of how small budgets were and the productions were. But seeing these massive sets, um, I, I love that Civil War set. There's so many extras in that movie. It's it's, it's massive in scale. Mm -hmm. um, but it pulls it off. And, and he's always able to maintain the character and the substance and the subtext of the story. And I do like the integration of the Civil War because he hadn't really touched on it too much in the other two films. But the Civil War is always a common thread in American Western. So I think that's maybe why you put it in in such an extensive way in uh, Good and the Bad. But you get good comedy out of it, too, when he and Tuco, they see the, uh, the, the, the army squad up ahead riding up ahead. And they think that, uh, oh, we're just allies. And then they wipe off the dust on their coats to show that they're the Union. And they're like, fuck. So you, they had great narrative elements to uh, use with the uh, the war uh, themes they put into it. These movies are really funny. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know when people talk about that as well. I love the scene when Tuchel has him around the rope and he's about to shoot him and there's a cannon that flies for the room and it just destroys the whole building and <laughs> it, it collapses. That really showed like the budget as well. Yeah, it's just, there's so many crazy set pieces and that's like you were saying that the Civil War is very David Lean-esque. I was talking about how it was, some of this was shot on the same locations as Lawrence of Arabia, but even that Civil War scene, the, the amount of people in that, and in, in that scene, like you were saying, it's very like that. I, I do think the first half is kind of the same quality as um, the few few dollars more, but once you reach that point where there's the shootout with Angel Eyes Men, I think it really takes a step up into being this like really super epic movie. 
uh, and which leads into that main civil war scene with the bridge. There's just the the sheer scale of that is incredible. And then there's the explosion of the bridge. What definitely one of the highlights of the film and the trilogy is just the sheer practicality of even doing that. Um, with pieces of rock flying at Blondie and Tuco. Um, I know they actually had to blow up the bridge twice because the first time the explosives were planted by the Spanish army um, and the, the captain of the army wanted to be the one that would set the explosions <laughs> off and he misheard the camera operator say they were ready. So he blew up the bridge when nobody was shooting the, on film. Um, so they had <laughs> to rebuild the bridge. <laughs> that's a great connection with uh, David Lean because of Bridge on the River Kauai. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, that. I, so I, it funny. looks like they almost get hit by debris as well in that scene. It, mm. it does not look safe. <laughs> yeah, it's just. Yeah, nothing. Like, obviously, safety back then a lot. A lot worse than it is now. A lot of us uh, uh, actors risking their lives um, for the shot. Def you can definitely tell it in these films, um, and that's kind of very evident in um, some of Kurosawa's films as well, which I think uh, reflect really nicely. Um, I think it's also funny that Clint Eastwood wore the exact same poncho in all three films. It wasn't replaced or cleaned once. <laughs> it looks good. Still looks good. It does look good. It does. <laughs> Um, uh, but yeah, this film, it, like, they're obviously they're all westerns, but they they just feel so different from each other. There's always something to add. Like, like you guys have been saying, the scope of this one is is insanely big. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's um, kind of touched on really nicely, and there's a lot more um, kind of character to character moments in uh, in this one in particular. Um, not necessarily kind of giving us background information, but kind of more kind of like slightly emotional beats that um that do happen in the middle of this film um which do make this film stand out definitely and just re-watching it and unfortunately over here the only version of this film is the that uh, is available is the extended version i have never seen the original cut of this film um ryan have you seen it yeah, I, I have it on physical, so I watched that version. How long is the extended version? The extended version is three hours. The, I, I have physical over here, well. but uh, it, unfortunately, it, it's it's um, the physical versions over here, the ones that I have, are um, all in English, and you cannot put the things into Italian, so it's dubbed over, and there's no way around it. And uh, it's extended for good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I'd like to see the original version, which does suck. Wait, um, I'm sure someone will know. What scenes are added into Good, Bad, and the Ugly that aren't in the original? I know a lot of the Tuco stuff. Like, when Tuco recruits the other guys to help him find Blondie, like, towards the mm -hmm. beginning, I know that that's one that was added. Uh, mm -hmm. I think maybe I could be wrong that there was, like, stuff cut down with the brother. I could be wrong about that. But I think I, I'm pretty sure it's a decently, like, amount of Tuco scenes that were. I've no, never I seen the about... non-extended cut. I've yes, only yes. ever seen the three-hour film. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's quite difficult to find the original. But if you, on Letterboxd, the um, the runtime is an hour, uh, two hours forty. So mm -hmm. the original is twenty minutes shorter than uh, than this cut. I I'd like to see the the difference, but um, I yeah, would I say, Alex, uh, you're probably right. It's probably less of the brother because they do talk for about mm -hmm. 15, 20 minutes in the church. Yeah, and it doesn't really yeah, change, thing. it doesn't really change your the story if you cut out the brother stuff. It changes yeah. your understanding of him as a character, but story wise, you can cut it out, and it doesn't really change much. Mm -hmm. mm. I actually think that scene's really important because I think it highlights some of the the brilliance in the writing of Clint Eastwood's character. Where you know Quentin T Tarantino calls this the best directed movie of all time, and I do agree with him that it's it's not the greatest script ever written. But I still think it's a much better script than than it gets credit for. And I think it is. And I think a big part of that comes from how well they write the character of Blondie, where he just he's always thinking so many steps ahead. And right after, I think one of the most uh, interesting parts of Leone's entire body of work that I connect with so much is that his themes of friendship and brotherhood. And he was an only child. And a lot of people think that he kind of always wanted to have siblings and 
because of that, uh, there's always like these strong themes of friendship and brotherhood that really comes full circle once we get to Once Upon a Time in America. But just Clint Eastwood's character, I think, is so good at thinking steps ahead. And right after that brother scene, you notice Clint Eastwood gives, there's so much like indirect communication in this film where he shares his cigar with Tuco. And he's basically like building an alliance with him. And like in this moment of weakness for Tuco where he's emotional and upset about his brother, Clint Eastwood's essentially treating him like a friend and a brother to win his support or win his kind of trust for wherever he might need it. Whether it's even though he does unload his, his gun for the final duel, it's like he still is building that alliance so that he even if the gun had been loaded, he would have shot at Angel Eyes and not Blondie. And I think the way, like, I love the kind of, like, how Clint Eastwood almost thinks like a poker player, just, like, steps ahead of everyone, I think is part of what makes uh, his character so interesting. And I think the writing of, uh, one, a great director who doesn't get a lot of credit, Alexander McKendrick, uh, he always said, he directed The Sweet Smell of Success, if anyone's seen that. And he always said characters you think ahead are more interesting. And I think, like, Blondie is a perfect example of just a character who's always thinking, so many steps ahead and when you go back and rewatch this film you see so much of kind of where he was where he was thinking ahead and planning and anticipating things that come full circle later in the film and he ultimately knew angel eyes was the real opposition mm -hmm. hence why he he never intended to shoot at Tuku at the end but also when he loses his power he's on death's doorstep walking through the desert he gives himself the power back by when he learns where the treasure is He's like Tuco, you gonna you gonna save me, or else you're never gonna find it. The makeup in that scene is brutal. Yeah, I, it looks like he's like permanently scarred from like an acid <laughs> attack or something. <laughs> very dry. That movie makes you very yeah. thirsty. Uh -huh. <laughs> I watched Lawrence of Arabia um, in theaters last week, and I was very thirsty the whole time. <laughs> I, was two of water. I went as well. I had two bottles of water. Forty X experience. <laughs> they make it 80 uh, 110 degrees in the in the theater <laughs> have any of you seen any anything from this trilogy in theaters i've seen no. good and the bad um at the new bev in tarantino's theater and it's fantastic oh that's nice. gotta be awesome yeah mm. i've seen yeah i wish wish ron and i had that uh lovely kind of nice mm. cinema nearby that would show stuff like that all the time but that only really exists in London around here, maybe a We're couple. Spoiled of I know you're Ryan. Now, Ryan, to be fair, you have uh, you have a uh, Glasgow. Film here, me. Yeah, yours yeah, is yeah, out, yeah, out here. Good. I mean, kind of countryside, not really much, but yeah, going to London is always nice. Until yesterday, prepping for this episode, I'd never seen one of these films at home. It was the first time I ever watched. <laughs> <that. laughs> I started That's DVD incredible. by nail on Netflix. 16, 17 year old me in high school, I would do three DVDs out at a time. I'd burn through every Western with them. <laughs> now I would never yeah, watch I, a DVD ever again, but. Yeah, Alex, Alex just lives in a cinema. Yep. It's crazy. <laughs> I've seen Good, the Band, and the Ugly four or five times in theaters now. Wow, that's awesome. Yep. Have you seen this Lawrence? Movie. Yeah, I've seen that three times in theaters. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's, that's I like would to see Lawrence of Arabian theaters. I'm so jealous yeah. that you've I, got a release. Really... I, I actually had the chance to yeah, a couple so months good. ago, but I didn't go, unfortunately. But it's good that a lot of cinema, big cinema chains around here are finally realizing uh, how to make the money, and they're just spreading just re-releases months and months ahead, and it's, it's looking great. Um, but yeah, just the, they're piling up the amount of re releases they're doing now, like big cinema chains. So, yeah, I'm glad that they're finally realizing that. Yeah, the, the 4K restoration looked fantastic, it was it was really beautiful, it was it was so well done. And so many people don't even understand how important that proper 4K restoration is to capture what the filmmaker's real vision was and how it played theatrically originally. Because even Blu ray, it's HD, sometimes a little higher up to 2K, but it's not the right color grade, not the right contrast so i always tell people when they ask me blue should i get blu-ray or 4k uhd I'll always get the 4k uhd restoration because that's really the closest thing to what the filmmaker made and the problem with streaming services is netflix hbo max prime they are showing you their version 
they're not showing you the filmmaker's version. They're not showing you even the Blu-ray version. They're showing the version that they made for their platform. So it's so important to watch that 4K restoration to get the proper film. Mm, that's what's annoying here because we don't actually have a 4K release of the Dollars trilogy. We only have Once Upon a Time in the West. So wow. I had to just get a Blu-ray version. Mm. Um, but yeah, Once Upon a Time in the West is gorgeous, the 4K restoration. I think these films really like also are the definition of like movies that like if possible need to be seen in theaters because I think the films that translate to TV the best are the more dialogue heavy films where like as long as you can hear what the character's saying and uh, understand you're able to follow the story where a film like this for so much about it of is the just immersive music and sound landscape along with you know the extreme of the really wide wide shots and the really tight close shots. I think makes such a difference seeing it in a cinema and you know hearing dirt bikes in the middle of the scene of tuco and his brother is not the ideal way to watch it <laughs> yeah you can't watch these movies with the phone cell phone next to you no uh where when you're in a theater you're given up to the power of the film and the, the when you're in a theater in a cinema the movie is in charge mm -hmm. when you're at home you're in charge you are controlling the situation you can pause it you can go take a piss and come back to it and not say anything you can respond to a text um but when you're in a theater you are beholden to the movie so it's all that's the, in movies like this where there even though there's some dialogue heavy moments there's so much n without any dialogue it's just the filmmaking and you can't detract from that from your mindset and i think some movies like this they don't track well with modern audience with younger audiences because they're when they do watch a movie they it's hard for them to focus and it's not their fault they're raised with smartphones and with social media and video games and so uh when they watch from home there's so many great classics that get pretty poor ratings for being boring or slow or what have you but it's really it's because the moment it gets a little slow they're going to look at their phone until something interesting happens and there's always that battle when people watch movies from home of trying to resist the urge to look at social media i have that problem too that's why if i watch a movie i try to put my phone in a different room if I can. Um, but that's always a challenge with older films because they're less uh, exciting on the surface and their pace mm -hmm. is so much slower, but they're more impactful. But it's, it's a movie that for a first time watch, it's tough to do on at, at home. Um, so it, it's always better to see movies like this in the theater whenever you can. Yeah, I, I think People it's can't even resist the arch to Sorry. Yeah. People can't even resist the urge to look at their phone in cinemas even more. Yeah. It's rare yeah, that I, yeah. I go and don't see somebody on their phone. <laughs> Almost every time I go to the movies, I have to ask someone to stop talking and put a phone away. It's getting to the point mm. where it's like the, the respect for the cinema is gone. There's still so many great mm -hmm. film goers who do respect it, but it seems like more common than ever that people are talking or using a phone during a film. And even though we grow up, every time you go see a movie, there's a PSA to not use a phone, not to talk. If you got if you're 30 years old you've seen that psa 500 times but still some people mm. just still they still get to talk and they're still going to use their phone mm. yep. yeah i sit row three so they're all they're normally behind me <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but i think that a big problem for younger audiences with these films is also like the just the watching at home element of like the competing sounds were like <laughs> such a big part of that final scene in good the bad and the ugly is the way Marconi's score is literally like a hypnotic experience and like it infects your bloodstream and just like literally is able to change your state of mind, how powerful the music is there and is really guiding the emotional weight of the, that sequence. Whereas when you watch it at home, it's like, like I live with people. So like if I'm watching it at night, so it's dark out, like I have to keep the volume down because, you know, maybe someone's on a call or, you know, someone might be asleep along with the fact that men in those quiet scenes. So, the music doesn't have that same hypnotic quality when you have to keep the volume low along with, you know, there's competing sounds. Like I live in the city, so there's always cars driving by, you know, there's always like someone might be making dinner in the other room. There's just always these competing sound landscapes that really do prevent you from just kind of immersing yourself in the experience. When I watch movies, I have to have the lights off and the volume up. Totally. I can't watch it. I can't watch a movie with lights on. I can't do it now. Oh yeah, it's it's no good. I have to make my room a theater. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick though, one 
one other thing I think that uh, I did want to talk about, the good, the bad, and the ugly, though, is the way Leone, I think a big element of his films is this kind of romanticism of brutality. And I think that when for A Fistful of Dollars came out, there was not that real, like, brutal and, like, sadistic joy in the brutality that we saw in that film compared to the American Westerns, where I know Anthony earlier talked about where he put the the gun under the camera for the gunshots. It was also the first film where we saw both the shot and someone getting shot in the same frame where the traditional Hollywood ones, one person would shoot the gun in one shot and then they would cut to them getting hit. But Leone was the first to like Leone knew nothing about the Hayes code or anything. So he was the first to show that in the same shot. But I think you really, it comes full circle again, once we get to once upon a time in America, but I feel like we can't not talk about the scene where Tuco's being brutally beaten as we're hearing like the most romanticized, beautiful music outside where I think he's directly like Marconi's music does so much to romanticize these films. And I think he's really making you aware of what he's doing to you as a filmmaker and how the music's manipulating you and just like aware of the romanticism of this brutality, I think is, is such an interesting part of his, his whole career as well. Great point. Would you have talked no, nah, not saying shit. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, he, it's great how he knows there's no point even trying to torture Blondie. Mm -hmm. I yeah, that's that. I love that scene. Him. That's so good. That was, again, I think that's why like the script is a lot better than, than people give it credit for. Absolutely, yeah. But yeah, did anyone else have anything they wanted to add on, on the Dollars trilogy? Watch it if you haven't. <laughs> mm. yeah. But at the yeah. same time, why would been listening this far if you haven't <laughs> spoiled, yeah. spoiled. you'd be surprised some people listen to entire episodes of ours and they haven't even seen the film yet because they don't yeah. mind spoilers it's it's funny it's interesting how people some people don't mind some people do mind <laughs> yeah i have a list yeah, i think that's trilogy the trilogy just kind of encapsulates everything that's great about westerns it's very perfection behind the camera um, especially when you get to the good the bad and the ugly um Top five westerns ever made, I at least oh, for me. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, so I have um, Good Man the Ugly for a few dollars more. Um, Once Upon a Time in the West, obviously my first. Um, I still haven't seen The Searches or um, Treasure for Sierra Madre yet, which I Treasure of Sierra Madre is my second favorite behind Good Bad the Ugly. It's absolutely um, phenomenal. It's one of the best yeah. movies ever made. Uh, really Searches, is absolutely, Searches is great too. Searches is such a mis, misunderstood film. People think that John Wayne's character is a hero, but he's, it's actually a film about hate and, and the, the, the problems with hate and violence and, and discrimination and racism. But people look at it the wrong way in the modern lens. Uh, but it's, it's an absolutely incredibly powerful film, The Searchers. But Treasure, Sierra Madre, make that your next watch. It's absolutely insane. It's Humphrey Bogart's best performance too. It's Andre. so good. Yep. Uh, the other week I watched uh, um, My Darling Clementine as well. John Ford, absolutely love mm -hmm. that film. That's another one of my Western favorites. Love Henry Fonda so much in Westerns. Well, also, if you general. like John Ford, the non-Western he made is The Quiet Man. He made in Ireland. Oh, I've seen that one. Mm -hmm. It's 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 John Wayne as well. It's one of the most beautifully shot films of all time on, on large format film, The Quiet Man. It's incredible. I couldn't recommend it enough for a John Ford movie that's not a Western. Yeah, I saw that yeah. one. I think it just kind of goes to show what we're speaking about, that just Westerns just aren't what they were anymore. Yeah. You know, um, i trying to remember the last great Western, Bone Tomahawk, I think I really, really, I quite liked. That's a really Django. interesting film. Oh, Django, yeah. yeah. I yeah, don't yeah. adore it as a lot of kind of other people do. I It wouldn't be one of my favorite Western. Western I think it's I'm not a hater. Um, <laughs> I, I still think it's a great film, but I think it's what I, I, he's never made a bad film, but I think it's towards the bottom of my Tarantino rankings. Um, oh, and so cool. three, ten, three Tens are a really great contemporary one. Three Tens, I still need to watch both of those, actually. Um, Gorb, Gorbavinsky's uh, The Lone Ranger, that was a really yeah, ma a massive Leone uh, influence on that film. The set pieces are incredible in that film, to be fair. That, that film got a lot of hate uh, when it came out people just absolutely bombed on that film um but i yeah, think the just... power of the dog is pretty underrated to be fair i think mean, that should have won best yeah, picture it did win best picture no it did it lost to uh coda coda 
Yeah. Was, oh, Jane was, Campion, one director. Yeah. yeah. Like one. Gotcha. Shit. Yeah. Man, yeah. You're right. It was the favorite until a few weeks before. <laughs> There have been some Oscars awful, like, like a week before that. Oscars there have been some underdog. awful best picture decisions this decade, dude. And let's talk about No Man Land. Fucking a. <laughs> 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 oh my God. Not a. Oh, it's just it's Francis McDormand. They 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 can't they can't resist they the love Academy her. lover. They love her. They do. McDormand taking a shit. <laughs> in a bucket <laughs> while they kicked and then when they held the oscars that year they took it they did it at union station in la which is like the big trade station in downtown and mm. they kicked out the 1000 homeless people who were living in the area to put on the oscars and they gave the best picture winner to a movie about homeless people That's and, being, and having to empathize with them <laughs> it was like are you guys is anybody not seeing that how crazy this is they just gave best picture to this movie after they kicked a thousand homeless people out of their homes to do the Oscars, the That's irony nice. is Oscar cool. story cool. ever. The irony, man. But back, backtracking a little bit, I because you mentioned how younger audiences have like issues with the pacing of older films. I think Treasure of the Sierra Madre is like one of the greatest films to get into older movies because I think it's just paced so perfectly. Oh. So yeah. if any of you are listening want to get into older films, like that's one I 100% would start with. I think it's such a a great introduction film into old Hollywood and definitely, like you said, Bogart's best performance. When Paul Thomas Anderson was making There Will Be Blood, he had his, he watched that movie every night. Mm -hmm. After filming, they would watch that movie. He and his, he and his Alice Witt. There's honestly That's so great. many similarities too, because yeah. like this, the themes of greed and stuff. I actually forget about Sierra Madre. I think of Western Westerns because I think of like cowboy movies, but yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's 100% Western. Oh, for sure. There are shootouts in it, so it absolutely mm -hmm. hits the beats. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of actually one thing about the Western that Leone really kind of changed from the American Western as well as like his view on like pessimism and like the American Westerns always kind of had to have this like optimistic ending, like hopeful ending for the most part. I think when you get into like the searchers, like you said, it's misread and it's actually a lot more pessimistic than people say. But uh, I think that I like how I like movie like it's the Italian in me and Italians typically don't believe in happy endings. Like if you look at Italian cinema, it's a lot of ending on downers. And I do like how Leone brings that to, to the Western as well. Like just a, a much more pessimistic kind of realism view on it. And he says his favorite John Ford movie is also my favorite John Ford movie, which is the man who shot Liberty Valance because oh, that's still Leone, the banger. It's banger Western. It's my favorite time. Yeah. Leone says it's the best. Cause that's when John Ford rediscovered pessimism. <laughs> It's really funny you bring up happy endings. I watched uh, Robert Altman's The Player the other day, and that film <laughs> just plays on the uh, uh, the. Yeah. That's such a brilliant film. One of the best uses of kind of it's meta, so meta humor and commentary uh, ever. <laughs> and um, that film just just takes the mick on the Hollywood of the repeated use of just happy endings. Like they can't make. They just repeatedly say they can't make a film unless it has a happy ending, and they have like that film. Uh, within the film of their making and like the ending changes when um when it comes to making it so it's hilarious hilarious film uh rob altman's an absolute genius um uh yeah watch it if you can it just takes a make out of hollywood for two hours and it's like it's it's brilliant absolutely brilliant yeah he's uh he's one of the most underappreciated american directors ever He's so good i think alex would like to don't, say, don't fucking say it <laughs> <laughs> Oscar wants to bring up the forbidden movie. <laughs> the long goodbye. <laughs> that movie. Oh, you don't like the long goodbye? I ah. hate the long goodbye. I, I, I went. Ah, I went but that ending, man. That ending. So Come on, man. You're, oh you're like, your so podcast is my favorite movie podcast. Please don't let me down by liking the long goodbye. I, hate <laughs> I, I am a, I'm a massive Robert Altman fan, and I was late to the party with that one, and. I didn't love the movie, but then the ending happened, and I was like, oh my god, it's so good. And it's also a great cat movie, and I'm a cat dad, so. See, that's one of the things I the most, because I'm a huge Raymond Chandler fan, like, he's my favorite author, and it's just uh, such a butcher job of the, it's like his most personal book, and like, the best book he ever wrote, and the movie's just such a butcher job of everything about the book. Well, I've never read it, so I'm now I'm not going to read the book. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. The movie. Just That's watch the great movie. I don't want to ruin <laughs> yeah. the movie. Yeah. Uh, Nashville. 
another incredible film. Nashville is insane, movie. man. It's insane. When Absolutely insane. This. When I watched that movie, I'm like, how the fuck did he do all of this? It's insane. There's like 300 characters in this movie. It's it's absolutely insane. Just like the magnolia of his time, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. But well, you know, PTA, PTA, um, uh, after he made Hard Eight and Boogie Nights, he first AD'd for Altman on a movie of his to just I learn did. from him. Hmm. He, he's Not his right. biggest influence. That's why Punch Drunk Love was really the biggest change in PTA's career where his first three movies, Hard Eight, Boogie Nights, Magnolia, huge ensembles, intersecting stories with the mm. tone in terms of the filmmaking and music that Altman did, he was like so influenced by Altman. But then with Punch Drunk Love, he started doing one character or two character driven dramas, Punch Drunk Love, Derby Blood, The Master. And then he found his voice really. And like yeah. you said, like, when you get to The Master, he starts taking influence from, like you mentioned, Jonathan Demi, who does yeah. really strong close up shots. Mm -hmm. But Magnolia and Boogie Nights, they're like, it's shortcuts. You know, mm -hmm. same actors, Phil Baker Hall, Julianne Moore. Crazy. Honestly, since, since we're talking about directors, one thing also I think we forgot to mention is it's interesting how different Leone and Clint Eastwood are as directors. They're essentially complete opposites. Like Clint mm -hmm. Eastwood's so famous for his uh, like efficiency. He always comes in under budget, under schedule. It's not really visually styled films he definitely leans on the dialogue a lot and leone is like the most drawn out like doesn't cut the fat like we'll just hold on something just because it looks nice type of director like they said he would take two hour breaks just for lunch because leone loved to eat so much like it's just so funny how they became complete opposite directors yeah clint has two oscars for directing yeah, they he's also made this 40 world. movies. He made 40 movies. The other one that's crazy. He won for uh, a million dollar baby. Million dollar oh, baby. Yeah. yeah, he's a, he's such an amazing director, too. But he's the mm -hmm. he just does one take. Yeah, <laughs> one take like Frank Sinatra. Yeah, it's, he's like he doesn't want to do more than that. But like, I people don't realize how he's how many films he's made, even a lot of the westerns he was in, he directed. And people have no idea. like. Mm. Like he's probably the greatest. He he is the greatest actor director combo, ever. Like no one's even close to him. Trying Not to just winning it. Oscars for it, but also making so many of them, making so many good ones. It's insane what that guy did. I'm probably trying to think who are the other notable yeah. names of actor yeah. and director. Ken Tarantino, Affleck, he's acting Ben Affleck, Tarantino, <laughs> <laughs> Ben Affleck. Yeah, well, it's um, easy because he's in uh, Dreams. Dreams. Yeah. He's in After Hours and Taxi Driver. His lines in um, Taxi Driver. David Lynch. It is David Lynch. That is the answer. <laughs> oh, yeah. It is David Lynch. That is the that is the clear answer. He is such a good actor. He's great in um the Spielberg film, Fablemans. The greatest movie. He's so good in Twin As John Ford, yeah. He's so good in every weeks. every time I watch a Western now, I just think of that scene talking about the horizon. Now get the fuck out of my office. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, so, I'm so kind of conscious of middle horizons now just because yeah. of that film. That shit. It's every so time I watch funny. a movie now and I see like a horizon on the top or on the bottom, I always think of that. Yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> Have any of you seen the one John Ford interview where they're like Mr. Ford, like the way you directed that battle was so epic and stuff. And they're like, how did you film that? He's like, with a camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> this is crazy. Like the Spielberg casting Lynch because they're, they're, they they feel like such similar characters, John Ford and Lynch, um, uh, in a way. But yeah, that was, that was such a nice surprise. <laughs> This will this will spark a bit of debate. Great actor director combination, Bradley Cooper. I love him. Mm. I love his movies. Oh yeah, yeah I forgot your. No, I'm, 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 I'm not. I'm not massive on uh, Maestro, but Star Wars one was was great. They I hated loved Maestro. Him. I loved it. I cried twice during Maestro. <sighs> was, um, I, I cried first. I cried first because I was so struck by the filmmaking, and then I cried when spoiler alert for anyone. Hasn't seen it when um, his wife passed away, but I was mm. just—I was in absolute awe of everything. And it's the, like the first movie since The Master where I saw a film where I was like, "Oh, it felt like it was a movie that was made 60 years ago." 
Yeah, I think I think his uh, ability as a director is absolutely there, and I thought it was shot really well, lovely, lovely visuals and composition. But the screenplay for me just let it down so much. I think it, I still thought the film was solid, but yeah, I think the screenplay kind of dragged it through the dirt and really let the direction down. Still only cry for one movie. <laughs> That's crazy. It's so one movie. Toy Story Three. <laughs> Dude, I cry at movies all the time. I cry. To be fair, I, 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 I don't cry a lot, um, but definitely more than the once that Alex has. I cry all the time at movies. Ryan said he cried uh, for Spider Man too. That's I've never cried in a superhero movie. I've never cried in a superhero movie. I nearly did. That's perfectly valid, by the way. It's not even that it's sad. It's just it's so good that you get emotional. It's... <laughs> no, it is emotional. The score, the score, and what's happening makes yeah. It's it makes music. Is emotion. music is the yeah. Emotion. I saw ET in theaters last year, and when the kids are running from the cops on the bikes and that music's playing, I was crying tears of joy. That's so <laughs> so insane. Oscar, would you like to share with Anthony the worst take ever mentioned on this podcast? <laughs> Oh, that is like mid tier Spielberg. E. He said that. Ah! King... Wait, he said Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was better than ET. <laughs> I don't stand by that. I said I think it's <laughs> nearly better than ET. They are very That's close. Still insane. I think ET is one of his best films, top three. I think it is his best. I think it's number one. It's top ten. Jaws is number one. Jaws, I think, is the best made movie. He ever. is made. Yeah. I actually but think he has made is so film. many better films than. E.T. is crazy. Watching in theaters. That's exactly what I said. That's exactly Because <laughs> you saw it when it was You might movie. change your opinion. You might change your opinion. Just, the it's, it's no Jurassic World. It's no Jaws. It's no Schindler's List. It's, it's no World. Readers. It's no Last Jurassic Crusade. Park, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. better. <laughs> it's not. I do think, I think Fableman's is top three as well. No, it's not. Fablemans is not top three. Apart it's if ignoring like Fablemans, he has not been on a great run. West, West Side, Side Story, movie. bro. West Side yep, Story. Best movie. I haven't that seen year. it. BFG Dude, stinks. Watch it. War Horse stinks. I West was late Story. to the West Side Story game and I watched it this year. Because I've I've never been a big musical fan, but my girlfriend's got me into musicals. And now I love musicals. Mm. And I watched a bunch of classic musicals and then I watched West Side Story. I was fucking mouth agape, jaw on the floor. Their set pieces in that movie are fucking insane. It's some of the best directing he's ever done. I was absolutely flabbergasted. Mm -hmm. And now in retrospect, I'm like, how did he... I mean, you can't give the MVP trophy to Jordan every year. But, like, how did he not win for directing for that movie? I do not understand. It's it was, insane. Um, insane. It was, it was 2018. He lost, he lost to Jane Campion. 2021. 2021, yeah. 2021 yeah, oh, yeah. But honestly, that I, year also was was tough. Yeah, Denis did Dune as well. Yeah. Denis then get nominated. I know, but I'm just saying in terms of like if we were to read yeah. the awards. I don't there's, know sequ I, there's sequences in that movie. I was just like, this. he really is probably the greatest director in terms of like how to move the camera, how to block his actors. Um, so many uses. He, he's just, he really is the king of wonders. People don't realize he's the king of wonders because he doesn't do a six minute wonder. But his films... No matter what movie it is, one minute long takes all over the place, moving the camera, two minute long takes, and they go unnoticed. Like um, Munich, the cinematography in Munich is fucking insane. Like the shit he was doing in that movie is just like mind boggling what he was doing with his wonders in that movie. Nobody really even talks about it. They don't really realize. Mm. Mm. I think even I, the wonders and Fablemans are pretty crazy at times. Yeah, people, yeah. Speak about that many views, have it's like a toned down Spielberg film. I, I watched AI ever. recently. Which, which one you watched recently? AI. Uh, AI is um, good. It is good. I I I, I, f I felt it was a bit disjointed at times. Um, just there's you kind of like a, there's a clear three act structure in this film. It's kind of time jumps. Um, but yeah, I just uh, I, I I still thought it was really good. Um, for the most part, but yeah, I think it's especially that second act. I think there's just the themes don't carry on for the majority of the film as i feel they should do um and i don't think it like translates that well to the ending um but yeah the direction is there and the, especially that second ad the production is absolutely insane i totally it's agree because it, kubrick if kubrick had made it it would have been what it was supposed to be mm. kubrick wrote the screenplay and he died before he could make it that was going to be his next film mm. and then spielberg 
um, he wanted Spielberg to take the reins. So Spielberg's um, voice didn't quite match up with that script. Mm. Um, but it's still it's still very good. I'm not. I think it's a little. I think it was some big news outlet named it number one film of the century. Indie Wire. I'm like Indie Wire. I'm like I don't know it what kind of drugs they're taking. Top film. No, it's top film of the 2000s, as in the decade yeah. 2000s. Yeah. I was um, like, I don't know what the hell they're smoking, but it's very, it's yeah. very good. But like, the thing is, uh, you know that critic David Ehrlich, um, quite a big. He's he's really good writer, but I think it's it was his kind of. He works for IndieWire. And I heard him kind of talking about it on Twitter because like loads of people like responding. He's like, this is really great list, but AI at one, really? <laughs> and like, because the top three was like 2046, Small Holland Drive, and Yee, which is like perfect. That uh, probably is the top three. That, that, that's perfect. Children, children, yeah. children of Men, too. Yeah, I would put yeah, Children of Men right up there, maybe number one. I actually haven't seen that one yet. And then uh, there will be blood. There will be blood. My favorite film ever. Oh. I think it's the best. The best of that decade and the best of the. Just, Lord films. of the Rings for me probably that one. takes that crown yeah. uh, for two thousands. Um, yeah. My top three might be the one you mentioned though. It might. It probably twenty forty six. Mulholland Drive. Then there will be blood. And then Yee. Yee's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Real quick though, because you mentioned Kubrick. A uh, fun fact I just remembered was that uh, Leone, when Kubrick was getting ready to do A Clockwork Orange, Leone and Marconi were finishing up Ducky Sucker, which is kind of like the forgotten movie of Leone's filmography. But Kubrick said to Leone, he's like, hey, I'd love Aeneo to compose Clockwork Orange. And because they were still working on it, Leone turned it down on Marconi's behalf without telling him. And Marconi considers it like the <laughs> one regret of his career that he never got to do A Clockwork Orange, simply because... Sergio just said no for him, and then Kubrick never reached back out or anything. <laughs> but one of the great I think with Morricone as well, obviously people just remember him most for Western films, but he's done so many incredible scores outside of that. Um, Days of Heaven in particular, I think outside of these Western films is probably my favorite of his. Uh, really incredible. Um, he did The Thing as well. Um, the Mission. The um, Untouchables. He's mission done some, yeah, he's done some great stuff with the Palma as well. Mm. The five. thing, the thing is so good. What a great score! Brilliant. Yeah, Cinema Paradiso. A lot of it with Tornatore, like Cinema Paradiso, is you could. I, I wouldn't put it as his best score, but you could argue that it is his best. Mm. And then so many like low key films you've never heard of. Like I just there's films that I haven't seen the film, but I've listened to the score of, like A Pistol for Ringo, which is just inc- like if you just listen to like a greatest hits of Mark Cody album, it's just some of the most incredible music you'll ever hear and the range like just the the versatility of him is so unmatched he's great he's the man no doubt. yes there's also a really great documentary i highly recommend to everyone giuseppe tornatore actually did it it's just called it's it's on amazon prime at least here in the u.s and it's called in neo the maestro from tornatore it's such a great documentary it takes you through his whole career from you know when he was doing arrangements for pop music of like a lot of the big Italian pop stars like Mina and Rita Pavone. And then oh, just. Oh, shit, really? Whoa. Yep. If you've ever heard a say. I love Mina. Uh, they have, you know what? Uh, say to Le Fernando. Mm-hmm. Marconi did the. No fucking movie. way. Yep, that's that's a, yeah, that's her best song. It, it probably is. Oh, honestly. my God. Yep. Yeah, he did arrangements wow. for a bunch of the biggest Italian pop stars all throughout like the 50s and 60s. Cool. And it takes through all of it. It's it's a, such a great documentary, and it's like he's. You're, they're actually. Inter- it was when he was alive. He filmed it like a year before he died, so you get a sense of like him as a person as well. Wow. Very cool. Yep. It's a real nice show. Does any? Did do the three of you have him as number one, or do you have him a little lower ranked? For well, composers. Oh yeah, all time composers. Oh yeah, he's number one. I yeah, have, probably is number one. I go uh, John Williams, Hans Zimmer, um, Ennio, Bernard Herrmann, and then um, I love I your career so far, but there's a major name you're missing. Howard Shaw, <laughs> Joe Hisashi. Nino Rota. Nino oh, Rota, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Nino Rota's great. Um I'm trying to think of um, some Japanese composers off the top of my head. I can't, but those are my top four. With Miyazaki, he's a great Mm. one. Mm. Danny Elfman might be my personal favorite. Oh, yeah, Danny Elfman. 
Yeah, he's great. Hans is my guy, though. He's he's my favorite to listen to. He uh, he's uh, definitely yeah. like kind of like a new Marconi and like the way he just is experimenting oh, yeah. and, and his instru- like his not real instruments that he uses as, as instruments. Like he is like a lot in a lot of ways the new Marconi. Also started in pop music. Yeah. Oh, and Ludwig too. You got to give a mention to him. He's Ludwig's great. Yeah, Ludwig's really great. Hurwitz, without Hurwitz. a doubt. Hurwitz. Oh, her. Yeah, Hurwitz. Hurwitz, her, Hurwitz. No one talks about because I think Ludwig gets all the attention, but Hurwitz is fantastic. Oh yeah. Mm. If only yeah. he had done more. Like he, I wish he composed more for more directors. Like he really only. Yeah, he, he just more. just mm. only sticks with uh, Chazelle. That's it. Just only wants to work with him. Yeah, well, he he like almost wins an Oscar every time, so why yeah, not? he does. He should have. I can't believe he didn't win last time. That should have been robbery of the twenty first century, in my opinion. Lost it to Foghorns on steroids. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I like that score a lot, but I, I think that film was just so hyped that it got people as votes. What do you mean? Uh, which way? Which... Western Front. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm. They won a ton of Oscars. Good. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a good score in the film, but you're, you're not putting on that to just listen to where yeah. Babylon's probably my most listened to song last year. Yeah. It was my most listened to album of that year. Of I guess it would be last year. It'll be interesting to see what he does now that he's in director jail. He's not in director he's making jail. A film, he's, he's, he's got made... a film coming out next year. You do realize that. Yeah, he's, he's making, making a film. <laughs> He just can't get a hundred million dollar budget anymore. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't need. He doesn't. He. I mean, the fir- first man had a big budget. It did pretty well. Box office didn't make that much, but it made some money. But um, he's just not going to get a hundred million dollar budget ever again. Yeah. But I mean, every studio is like. The thing is, like, even if the studio doesn't think they're going to make money, with someone like him, it's like, oh, we could. We have a good chance at getting twelve Oscar nominations, mm. which is super helpful for them. And adds a lot to their pedigree. So, uh, with him, he'll never he'll never not be able to get a movie green lip. He won't be able to make a giant scale Babylon ever again. Yeah, I'm glad Babylon exists. Then I'm glad he died <laughs> for our sins. <laughs> <laughs> Sacrif- sacrifice his his budgets to to bless us with the best film of the first century. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, Whiplash is actually getting rescreened this year. Yeah, ten year anniversary. Yeah, it is. I think that's his best film. I actually think it's his third. To be honest, I think it's a ten out of ten, but I think it's his third best. I got Babylon and La La Land, then Whiplash, and then First Man at a four, at a four and a half. I think was- um, La La Land is my favorite still, but I adore pretty much all of his films. Mm-hmm. I think La La Land is tied with Knights of Kiberia for the best ending in film history. That is interesting. There will be blood as the best ending ever. That's valid. That's very valid. I don't think that's what mine would be. Um, Paris, Texas. The good, the bad, and the good, the bad. Paris, Texas is a good pick. (laughs) That's my favorite film, so. Honestly, Once Upon a Time in America is up there, too, though. I love that ending. True. Wait, Ryan, you said you haven't seen Once Upon a Time in America, right? Yeah, I've not got to it yet. I, I was going to watch it in preparation for this, but then I realized it was like four and a half hours, <laughs> and I didn't have time to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> the only Leone I watched at home until yesterday. <laughs> Anthony, you've seen Once Upon a Time in America, right? Oh, yeah. Nice. I think it's just the most perfect, like the best looking images with the best score of all time. Like just music and picture, like is in terms of just those two things, it's the peak of what cinema can be. He also created basically the what people think of as like the shot of Brooklyn. Yep. In mm-hmm. The meat district, the meatpacking district. Might be the best image in film history, in my opinion. Like that's yeah. true. Perfect. Yeah. I think when when he got there, like it was just he's such a detail oriented director and like he was able to finally have all his details. Like in his personal life, he collects antique furniture. And by then it was, he was able to like make his set designs like perfect to exactly what he wanted. Like with every, like the most precise 
like he was he's one of those really precise detailed directors and like he finally had the budget where he could actually bring that to life like james wood said he even was able to time when it would rain he was like all right we have 12 minutes camera needs to be rolling like rain's gonna hit and like he perfectly timed rain like just the craziest shit it's definitely james woods is his best performance too he's no, not like very douchey in that movie <laughs> yeah he's not lester diamond <laughs> <laughs> He'll always be defined by Casino, I think. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, honestly, that's uh I think it's like subtly such a great performance from De Niro, too. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course he gets lost in the mix of like the fact that it's De Niro, but like because just he has so many of the best performances in history. But that's one I think not enough people talk about. Yeah, he had a really interesting seventies. Yeah, well, that one was the eighties actually. It took, was it eighties? Yeah, eighty four. It took Leone thirteen years to get that one made. Oh my god! And he actually been working on it way longer too. It took him, I think, like twenty something years from when he got the book to when he finally was able to bring it to life. It's crazy, but it's actually interesting too because uh, it. So in Italy, they don't write scripts the same way we do here. They have on one side of the page is all the direction, and one side is all the dialogue. And they said Leone wrote the Once Upon a Time in America script where like the action was just full and then the dialogue side was just empty and he gave it to his <laughs> writers and it's like all right you write the dialogue <laughs> uh visual director yep some directors are you take woody allen he's just it's all dialogue and the camera barely moves and then someone yeah. like sergio it's all visuals and people barely speak and then you get like a tarantino where like there's just a, a blend of both yeah because tarantino like directs a lot like leone but his his writing is totally something different i don't think anyone I, writes like tarantino but yeah no one no one does he's probably the greatest mm. screenwriter ever now at this point after especially after once upon a time in hollywood um, i would say I think, I think he solidified himself i still think link later takes that title for me link later is great but also you get to factor in the before trilogy ethan hawk and julie delpy co-wrote with him mm. Whereas Tarantino, Tarantino has had a co-writer with Pulp Fiction that's otherwise he wrote everything on his own. Yeah. The the only other person, I think he's easily the greatest character writer of all time, undebatably. No one writes characters better than him. Overall, I would say Billy Wilder's on his level, at least. Oh, Billy Wilder's great. Because his films don't age, even a little bit. I just watched Double mm -hmm. Indemnity um, a few nights ago. It's so good. It's my favorite one. The apartment is amazing. Yep, Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, Sunset Boulevard. Sunset Boulevard is my favorite of his. It's very close for me. Like mm -hmm. double, it's like Double Indemnity and Sunset Boulevard are like neck and neck. But we're all big Sunset Boulevard fans. I love how in the fifties and sixties, like the cool job, the sexy job for a guy was to be an insurance salesman. <laughs> it's like that was like the suave. Oh my God! He's an insurance salesman. He's a tie. He's he's a he's a safe, well-paying job. Like that was the pinnacle of being a man in America. <laughs> or bank manager. <laughs> like he works at the bank. <laughs> yeah, like, like the the hottest actors in Hollywood are playing these guys. Oh, I work at the bank. I have my own desk. Like that was, like the the spy of our time, or like the John Wick. <laughs> Today, it's like that's the character you see. Who's like the like William H. Macy and Fargo type of like character of like yeah. in this boring life. Yeah. It's so, yeah. <laughs> or like a serious man. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> I love it. Speaking of like spy though, actually, I, I didn't realize until I was doing research for this, how much the, the dollars trilogy actually has influence from James Bond as well. Because James Bond was a, my grandparents described seeing Dr. No for the first time as the first time they ever saw the hero of a movie kills someone in cold blood, like where it wasn't self-defense and like just the mystery around him, the style and also the opening credit sequences, like those elaborate titles. Like you had never seen that in the Western. It's very James Bond. Yeah. It looks exactly like the intro to James Bond, like in those hand draw intros, especially for Festo at least. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, we've been at this about two hours. So Anthony, if you got to get out of here, totally all good. <laughs> My pleasure. It was, it was a great time. Great chatting, everyone. Really look, great to have you on. Love chatting about all uh, the greatest trilogy in film history, in my opinion, along with a lot of other great directors. Uh, 
thank you again, Anthony, so much for coming on. Uh, where, uh, just for the audience members who maybe if they haven't seen your show, uh, where could they find you, your socials, all that stuff? That Raiders of Lust podcast, you can find anywhere you would watch or listen to anything, Spotify, Apple, Amazon, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, we're everywhere. Um, and we do four episodes a week, so we bang out a ton. Great awesome. podcast. That's Thanks, a lot man. of mm. that's a lot of content. Thank thank you so much for coming yeah. on. It was a great episode. Like, subscribe, comment down below. Which is your favorite film of the Dollars trilogy, and what is your favorite western? And we'll be back again next week. Thank you for watching.